Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Uttinger, and we've been going through a series on the Trinity. We thought we were going to do one episode, ha, this is part three, probably the end, because you just shouldn't have more than three episodes on the Trinity, I feel like. Although I did have a friend in college who did entertain the idea that there could be more than three persons of the Trinity. Didn't Benny Hinn suspect there were nine Holy Spirits at one point? That wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> yeah. So, Emily, what are we going to talk about that we haven't already said? Well, we haven't done justice to, not that we ever will, but we haven't talked enough about the love among the persons of the Trinity. Um, so that's what we were hoping to start off with today, the Father and the Son breathing back and forth the Holy Spirit, and how, because we believe in the Trinity, we can believe in a God who is essentially loving. If we believed in a purely monotheistic God, there would be no one outside of him who is eternal to love. Um, and so the the God of the deist and of the Muslim requires, if he's going to show love, which the Muslim God doesn't <laughs> necessarily, but if he's going to show love, he has to create something. He needs something in order to show love. Whereas because we believe in the Trinity, we can believe that God in his own nature aside from anything outside of himself, can love, because there's this interpersonal dynamic going on even within the Godhead. There are so many things that we could tag off of what you just said, but the word dynamic struck me just now, because dynamic speaks of action and life. There's a wonderful section involving the doctrine of God, where he talks about that very idea that God is ever overflowing a fruitful life. He's not a static sterility. He's not just there, but he is constantly, and, and this is in Augustine too, you're always at work, always at rest, never moving, always moving. There's, there's that, what for us is a paradox, because we can't think in the same divine terms that God thinks, but everything for us is analogy, something that Bobby Costa deals with, mm -hmm. I think in that same that same context. We're always limited by the facts that, that we're creatures and what we speak must be analogical and in that sense anthropomorphic. Not to say it's not true. <clears throat> it's just that we can't say it all with our words. And we certainly can't say it all at once. <laughs> and so we, we, we want to distance ourselves from the idea that God is some kind of pure thought that just is. But at the same time, we also certainly acknowledge that he's not like the pagan gods running hither and yon, trying to to make things work. Um, Helter Skelter always frantically busy because everything's about to fall apart. <laughs> he is sovereign. He is omnicompetent. And yet there is this idea of what we would call, if it were in human society, motion, life, vigor, dynamism, moving power. Because these things are so difficult, as we keep saying in this series, we have to keep going back to the language of Scripture. If we get very too very far from it. We start making up things that are questionable or that aren't clear. And so we need, we do well to, to constantly be immersing our minds in the language and the imagery of the Bible itself. But anyway, that was just one thing. We, um, we, we in the West don't think a great deal about the other thing you mentioned which is the procession of the Holy Spirit. When I was writing on this subject, I looked through the American and British theologians and found almost nothing beyond the bare statement of the doctrine. The Holy Spirit proceeds eternally from the Father and the Son. And some acknowledgement that the Eastern Orthodox Church doesn't believe that, rather firmly doesn't, and loudly doesn't believe that, but there wasn't a whole, much, a whole lot of discussion as to why it matters. Mm -hmm. And there hasn't been a lot of, of, as far as I can see, discussion of the very word proceeding and, and the word spirit. You know, we think of the Holy Spirit. We think, okay, the Holy Spirit's the third person of the Trinity. We're done there. <laughs> Proceeds. Comes from the Father in some way that's not begotten, and we're done. <laughs> now, we, all we I got. think we, yeah, that's all we got. Well, I think the very words do go a little further, not a lot further. But I think it's important to pay attention to. 
first of all, proceeding means, again, we're back to this idea of movement. Something that mm -hmm. proceeds is moving from A to B, whether it be in time or in space or in some other way, whether it be just a logical conception of something. From that idea proceeds this idea. You know, but, but there's some idea, some concept of development or expression or moving forth or transit or something that's going on there. The other thing is the word spirit. And in Hebrew, that's in Greek, the word for breath, wind, and spirit are all the same. So we, we can speak of the Holy Spirit, but we can also speak of the breath of God. And throughout the Old and New Testament, God is constantly comparing the Holy Spirit to breath. Jesus breathes on his disciples. It says, receive ye the Holy Spirit. Isaiah 11, Messiah will slay the wicked with the breath of his mouth. There are many like things all the way through Scripture, even in the in the first chapter of Genesis, where the Spirit of God moves upon the face of the water. Some liberals have been tempted to translate a great wind from God. Well, that's not what it means, but you can see how they can pretend it might mean that, especially since later on in the days of Noah, after the flood, a great wind from God does move on the face of the waters. <laughs> so God punning on his own uh, representation of himself. How do we know that that second instance isn't, again, the Holy Spirit? I'm just curious. Uh, because no one has ever asked that question, and therefore it couldn't possibly be a valid one. What are you doing to me here, Emily? <laughs> I actually have never seen anybody discuss that, and I am not a Hebrew mm -hmm. expert. And the, the context is how the, how the water on the planet was disposed of. And, and as I have read it, I've always visualized a physical win, but Maybe somebody who knows Hebrew better can go back and look at it and see if there's any possibility of what you're suggesting. Because I don't know. But certainly there's a at least a literary correlation between the two. Mm -hmm. So returning to God, then we know that the Son is the Father's word. Well, the Spirit then is his breath, the breath that proceeds. And the question that should come up then is proceeds from the Father. To where? To where? <laughs> to where? And I can't find anybody who's really asked that question. Of course, I haven't read everything by any means. But it, it would seem to be the logical question to ask. And when we say again that the Spirit proceeds from the Son, again, we should ask to where or better, to whom? To whom? <laughs> uh, we're told uh, more than once that the Spirit, that the Son is in the bosom of the Father. But he's face to face with the Father. He's with the Father in that sense, not just mere proximity, but that kind of closeness. When when uh, a man and his son, or a man and his best friend, come together to to speak, to speak privately, they conspire. They there's mm -hmm. that word spirit, or the Latin word spiro, to spiro spirare. I don't remember the rest. To to breathe, to breathe with. It seems then that what God is telling us is that the Holy Spirit is the breath of the Father and of the Son, breathed from the Father to the Son and from the Son to the Father. Now, the danger there, of course, is then if you start thinking of the Holy Spirit as a thing, and that, mm. of course, is not what we're saying. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. But this approach does answer a really critical question that, again, most of the, at least the Western systematic theologians have kind of ignored. They will say things like, well, the Father loves the Son, proof text, proof text, proof text, and the Son loves the Father, proof text, proof text, proof text, and the Holy Spirit loves the Father and the Son. Moving on. Wait. <laughs> Wait. Where, 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 where are the proof texts? Oddly enough, they're not there. The Holy Spirit is never described as loving either the Father or the Son. There are some hints here and there perhaps about his being part of the process of communication, Jesus seems to include the Holy Spirit when he says "We that we have heard, we testify. But this you would think this would be central. Why isn't the Holy Spirit said to love the Father and the Son when the other is so clear and abundant, particularly in John 17, the high priestly prayer? And the obvious answer at this point would be because he is the love. And this was Augustine's mm -hmm. answer. Uh, in his famous work on the Trinity, of which I commend anybody who wants to follow up the stream of thought, because none of this obviously is ever told us. 
<laughs> but he he goes as far not only to say that the the Holy Spirit is the love, is the bond of love shared between the Father and the Son, but he quotes the passage in First John that says God is love, and says argues I, I I don't think quite convincingly, but just to show you where his thought was that the person of the Godhead who is love is in fact the Holy Spirit because he is that bond of love. He is the existential, personal, divine, sentient love that's shared from Father to Son and from Son to Father. And that's about that's about where we end. We can't go a whole lot further <laughs> than that. But we can contrast it with, say, of the Eastern Orthodox perspective, where the Father begets the Son or speaks the Word on the one hand, breathes forth the Spirit on the other, and the Son and the Spirit have no direct connection with each other. You have the Father, who is the source, but there is no communication ever backward. He overflows or breathes out or begets or speaks, but nothing ever comes back to him. It's a one-way chain of command, a one-way channel of revelation. In fact, two channels of revelation. One is the Spirit, or in the Spirit, and the other is by the Word. And so in the Eastern Church you have uh, the mystic, who experiences God, whether in the worship service or through icons or such. Mystic experiences of various sorts. And then you have a theologian who studies the word. And these two things don't have to go together. And generally in the Eastern tradition, don't a whole lot. But it's also very consistent with Russian culture, both before and after the revolution, because you have, before the revolution, where Orthodox Christianity was the state religion, you have the Tsar as the solitary monarch, the imperial authority, who issues commands downward. And when the, when the uh, Bolshevik Revolution took place and the, the Marxists stepped in, that pattern was already there. The Russian people were used to it. They were used to a voice that speaks downward through a bureaucratic chain of command. They were not used to a world where communion and communication is ultimate reality. And it took, oh, a thousand years or so for it to manifest itself. But we're, we're, we've seen that doctrines that seem obscure, minor, we say this, we believe it, we don't know what it means, let's go on to something more important, can actually change the course of history given mm -hmm. enough time. Yeah. And if we consider how we as the church are united to God in this present age, uh, we have the spirit as a down payment of the things to come. And if we're following the Russian model, that means we're connected to the spirit, but not to the sun. We, you know, we're sort of left out of Jesus. Yeah. Which is odd. And so in, in the West where we have the dual procession with the father and son breathing the Holy Spirit back and forth to each other, that puts the church right in the middle of all this interpersonal love that's already happening. What you just expressed, I first came across in um, R.J. Rush Jr.'s Foundations of Social Order, and uh, I believe it's the chapter on the procession of the Spirit. Uh, and he was quoting another author, and um, who was quoting another author, I believe. I think he goes through shop <laughs> back further to someone else, and I don't have my little booklet on the Greek hand, so I can't remember the, the order. But I know when I was writing on this, I was trying to trace back where Rush Jr. got this, but the, the, the original author said almost exactly what you just said that the doctrine of the, of the double procession places the church in the heart of the communion between the Father and the Son, where she is in the bosom of God and where all things are hers, as opposed to off in some corner of the kingdom, whether she is in the heart, in the center of the kingdom. Because, as you say, the Holy Spirit indwells the church, and the Father and the Son, through the Spirit, both indwell the church, this is a position of incredible privilege and of communion that Jesus talks about in his um, farewell dis discourse and in his high priestly prayer at some length. Very deep and difficult things, but well worth our time and study. And I, again, don't claim to have mastered it at all. But for those who want to pursue this, that's a good place to begin. John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, to read it over and over again and see the relationship that the church has with the Father and Son by virtue of the Holy Spirit. Uh, this is not a um, partialism where each person of the Trinity in turn does something for us and then clocks out and goes his way and lets the next one take <laughs> over, which I think sometimes we kind of get 
Anytime we try to explain something simply for children or new converts, uh, we run the range of oversimplifying. And that's okay to a point as long as somewhere along the line we say, okay, now, what I didn't tell you before was, <laughs> but I think it's very easy to give the idea, both with regard to the work of the Trinity and of the Son, that, well, first God predestined, and then that he's done, and then Jesus came, and he's kind of done sitting down someplace, and now the Holy Spirit's working. And that's not really what salvation is at all. And then with the work of Jesus, okay, well, he taught us when he was on earth, and he offered himself as a priestly sacrifice on the cross, and now he's ruling as king, or if you're just some sage, he'll be ruling as king one day when he comes back. And all of these things get separated and spread out rather than being part of an organic, ongoing, eternal relationship that man was placed into in the beginning, mm -hmm. not by virtue of, of any ethical merit, and not in any ontological sense. Man wasn't made God, but he was placed in communion with God. And that's where eventually we're going with this, maybe a little this time and, and the next. We, we come to this word covenant, where God reveals himself to man and demands things of man and promises to man particular things, not as an outsider, not as, well, we're the Trinity over here having this little party. Hey, you over there, why don't you go do something for us? And we're going to sit over here and ignore you for a while. But rather, man is constantly in the very heart and fellowship of the three persons of the Trinity until man rebelled. And that's a subject for a very later time, I suspect. <laughs> yeah, I was researching today because I did actual research for this podcast, <laughs> researching the covenant of redemption. I'd seen a little bit of chatter about it on Twitter, mm -hmm. mostly among Lutherans, which is weird because Lutherans don't talk about covenants like ever. So I was like, okay, what is all this about? So the Covenant of Redemption, the best source I found was Burkhoff's Systematic mm -hmm. Theology. Yeah. And he places his definition at the very end of the chapter, which is a little bit annoying. <laughs> like, you couldn't have started with that, Louis, come on. But he says, the Covenant of Redemption may be defined as the agreement between the Father giving the Son as head and redeemer of the elect, and the Son voluntarily taking the place of those whom the Father had given him. Which leaves out the Holy Spirit entirely, which is silly because throughout the chapter, he's talking about the Holy Spirit's role in all of this. Maybe he was just tired by the time he wrote the conclusion. Yeah, I'm sure he was. No. I would Bur be tired Burkhoff. if I wrote a chapter. <laughs> Burkhoff's work is well worth reading, and I believe that was my introduction to the whole doctrine of the covenant of redemption, if that's what we want to call it. Pe people have objected to oh, – let's back up just a second – People have objected to using the word covenant with respect to God for a couple of reasons, which I think have some validity, but I think there's there's ways around them that, that aren't cheating. First is, well, the Bible never uses it. And theologians over the years have tried to find this verse or that verse that seems to speak of what's going on in the Trinity as a covenant. And to, to my mind, they haven't succeeded. The, the phrase, the Council of Peace from Zechariah was used for a while, but that seems to be talking about something else. So mm -hmm. there's that. But, but, you know, the word Trinity isn't in the New Testament either, and we use that without any difficulty. So I don't think that's fatal. Mm -hmm. It would seem then that, well, let's look at what the elements of a covenant are and see if we find those in the Trinity. And we begin to sort of, there's, there's the Father taking a lead and coming up with a plan, and then representing himself in the Son, who is his word, his Son, who then agrees to certain stipulations. He will obey the broken covenant, take up the, the covenant, long covenant of obedience, rather than failed. And God promises to do things for him, which include granting him the Holy Spirit to accomplish all of this, the Holy Spirit in his humanity, to pour out the Spirit without measure upon him. And then upon his uh, atoning death, his resurrection, to grant to to raise the son to his right hand and give him the spirit to pour out. So you can, and then this will continue throughout history. <laughs> so most of the the, the the parts of the covenant are there, sort of. But is the father really the the suzerain of the son? That seems to be <laughs> a little bit of a stretch. And is, is there blood here? Well, there's Jesus' blood for us, but the Son at no point is taking upon himself 
a blood, at least as far as I can see, taking upon himself a, a self maledictory oath with regard to the father. He's going to do what the father says. That's not in question. Right. And he's, but he's going <laughs> to die anyway. So I, I, there, there seems to be all of the elements of a covenant almost. Yeah. It's certainly not a covenant like the ones we know. Yeah. And I think you've just, you've just nailed it. It's not like the covenants we know. But when we start talking about God and himself, nothing is like what we <laughs> right. know. Exactly. Not love, not intelligence, not rationality, not strength. It all is different in God. And so if we want to use the word covenant with respect to God as he is in his essence, the three persons eternally loving and begetting and breathing and existing, I, I think that that's fine. We just have to qualify it and say that's what, but that's archetypical. What's in God is not quite what's in us because the two factors of creation and sin make a world of difference. Mm -hmm. And then we can talk more specifically as Burkhoff does about, well, what, what is this eternal plan? Because when the father and the son communicate, they communicate not in music or in bare emotion, but in real concepts, ideas that can be put into words. We're told in the first couple of verses of Titus, that God promised salvation before the foundation of the world. And the question is the promise from whom to whom, well, from the Father to the Son. The promises come in words. Now, mm -hmm. now, then we're back to, but wait, does that mean that God speaks in Hebrew amongst, amongst himself? Not, no, probably not. <laughs> but it's the closest analogy we have, and, and because the Bible uses it, it is a true analogy. God, the Father to the Son, even before Jesus' incarnation, even before he prayed in his humanity to his father, they spoke in some fashion. And we have a record of it in Genesis 1, in Genesis 3, when for the benefit of all rational creatures, they spoke out loud in our atmosphere, let us make man. The man has become as one of us. <laughs> and then again in Genesis 11, yeah. go to, let us go down and <laughs> see this tower. <laughs> That's a funny one. We'll save that for another time, where God is actually mocking man, using heavy <laughs> sarcasm and irony. So it is proper to, to speak of this relationship being a word-oriented relationship. Again, always remembering that what is in God is not quite the way it is in us, but nonetheless, the words we use are true <laughs> words. They're just not exhaustive. And so in that sense, we can most certainly call this plan that God had a covenant. Well, what's a covenant about? Mm -hmm. It's about redemption. How is that different mm -hmm. from the covenant of grace? Well, the covenant of redemption then is the the plan, the eternal decrees of the triune God, with the Father taking the lead to make those decrees, but the Son and Spirit being involved in the whole thing. Uh, whereas the covenant of grace is the covenant that God makes with his people in Christ. And obviously, these are intimately related. Some people don't even want to. Uh, separate them. There have been various ways through the centuries of theologians trying to simplify it or harmonize it. I think part of the problem is simply inserting the word covenant and then trying to feel, feeling duty bound to make it become something it may not be. So Gerhardus Voss mentions that because they're all equals, the, the members of the Trinity are equal in power and glory, that they are specifically not duty bound. That's the phrase he used to accept this covenant. It's something they enter into freely. They enter into freely out of love, out of joy. Mm -hmm. Now, we could go further and say, but because they are, for instance, speaking of the first two persons, the Father, in, in proposing this plan, and again, we're bound by temporal considerations, does that mean they're talking through time and that things happen before and after? Not exactly, but it's the Bible speaks of things happening sequentially, as it were, before the world began, before there was time. So again, all we can do is echo what the Bible says. The father's love is of the form of, hey, my son, greatest person in the world, perfectly perfect representation of me. I'm well pleased in him. I want him to make him the hero of the story. And the son's saying back, but you're my father. You're the greatest. I want to glorify you. And the Holy Spirit being the bond who says, okay, let's make this happen. And I hope there's no irreverence here. I'm just trying to, to pick up on some kind of human metaphor that maybe will communicate <laughs> something of what was going on there. It's they they accepted freely, but they accepted freely in terms of the relationships that are eternal within the Trinity itself, Father, Son, and Spirit. 
So it's not arbitrary. The son should be the one who should become a man and go to the cross. That was the way it had to be. It's not arbitrary that the Holy Spirit is what breathed into the earth, into the hearts of men. That's the way it had to be, given who God is. And yet, yes, there's an absolute freedom here where God is free to be what he is, not hindered by any kind of outside restriction. And you could argue, well, he's bound by his own nature. He doesn't have a problem with that since he's perfect. <laughs> wow, perfection, what a horrible burden. <laughs> we, we might find trying to live up to God's perfection a burden, but he certainly doesn't. And so it's with great joy, overflowing joy, overflowing life and love, that God sets about creating heaven and earth and making man in his image. And so in all this, where you, where you started us is exactly where we should start, that God had a plan. And it grew out of the fellowship that was eternal in the Trinity. Now, so we're back to that temporal image. So first there was fellowship, then there was a plan, <laughs> then there was agreement. No, it's it all it's eternal. Yeah. But we can and we have to think sequentially if we're going to think at all. And mm -hmm. we 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 leave it at that and know that we have not said it exactly right, but that we are approximating as best we can what Scripture tells us mm -hmm. when it lays out these facts throughout Scripture. The, yes. the fellowship is real and eternal. The plan is eternal. God's purposes are eternal. And there, there, there is something, although God himself was above time, with respect to earth, there was a time before the foundation of the earth when the Lamb was slain. Mm -hmm. and, and so we, we, we tread through the, the shadow of light. The light is so brilliant, <laughs> it all seems dark. But the light is true. Yeah, one of the things that uh, helped me sort of wrap my mind around this idea that it's a covenant, but not like anything we know, and that's why we have a hard time putting that word on it, is uh, actually in the word that the Bible doesn't use in the Greek. Uh, the typical word for a covenant in those days was um, in the Greek, syntheke, mm -hmm. which means a meeting together or running together, and so by implication, a contract or a covenant. But when the Old Testament was translated into Greek, the translators decided intentionally not to use that word because it implies a parody mm -hmm. that there's an equality among the members here. So they chose instead diatheke, which is more, it's the verb that you use, or well, related to the verb that you use when you're placing laws in place, you're giving them down. So that's the word we find throughout the Greek tran translation of the Old Testament for covenant um, is diatheke. The word syntheke is nowhere. Mm -hmm. And so I believe it's Burkhoff who mentions that if we can talk about this covenant of redemption, that is the place where this word would be used. Mm -hmm. And that sort of emphasizes the difference between our covenants that we have from God and this covenant that we can talk about in eternity past where the members of the Trinity conspire together mm -hmm. to g give us this covenant of grace. First Peter one, two is actually, I think my favorite summary of it that I found today it says Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the father through sanctification of the spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. There's this triune intention mm -hmm. that we're given a glimpse into. And that is the source of our relating to God is his intention to bring us into that communion and fellowship. It's a triune communion and therefore a triune involvement in our redemption. It is not mm -hmm. only the work of the son. Although the father has assigned him what would seem to us to be the central role of hero. And yet he, the son himself, is constantly reflect, reflecting and deflecting back to his father. In the spirit, we, we, we find more, more references to the spirit in the New Testament. But even so, he's kind of low-key because Jesus says, he's coming to glorify me. And again, mm -hmm. that's, that's his role in all of this. And there's so much we can we could go on and talk about all of this forever and ever. <laughs> There's a couple things I would like to hit just because when you say things, I think of things. <laughs> the, uh, Good. I, and I'm sorry, I don't have the word, the Greek word for covenant in front of me. Would you say it for me again? Diatheke? Uh, yeah, that. 
<laughs> I, I, I can write it, but I, I don't think I've ever pronounced it out loud. It's the same word that's used for a will and testament. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, again, the unilateral nature of the thing. We are not equals with God. We do not come on the same level ground to God and say, hey, let's make a deal. We have some ideas. Uh, we hear you're, you're coming up with a plan. We'd like to give it. We, we get done with that. It is completely the decree, the covenantal, the testamental decree of our Heavenly Father as to how this is going to come down. Uh, in, in the uh, in the book of Hebrews, where uh, the writer is discussing the covenant, and a lot of versions render the word covenant, King James says testament. And the complaint mm -hmm. is, well, no, it should be covenant. Well, no, it shouldn't, because <laughs> because right there, the nuances, the, the connotation is obviously that of a testament, because they're not that different in Greek thought. And so the writer can, I don't know the pun is the right word. I think it's just seeing the other, a fuller dimension of what the word can mean. But he obviously takes it to mean a last will and testament that relies upon the death of the testator. Now, in case we're not sure about that, we get to Revelation chapter four, and the or chapter five, rather. And we, we see the father upon the throne extending a document say, sealed with seven seals toward the elders who represent the church. And a search is made throughout heaven, earth, and hell for somebody, somebody to come who's, who's worthy to break the seals and open and execute what's written within. And only after it's played out do we find out what the problem was because the solution is redemption. You are worthy because you were slain and you've redeemed us. Well, what, what is this all about? We're bringing in here the concept of redemption and the kinsman redeemer. God's people, God, God's offering his people an inheritance. Last will and testament, but there's a problem. There's a debt on the estate that has to be paid before God's people can receive their inheritance. And we're looking for 4,000 years, we're looking for somebody who is worthy to be the executor, who fits the job description. God can't do it, not God in his essence. Angels can't do it. Human beings who are sinful cannot do it. Demons certainly aren't involved here. Animals don't make it. And so for 4,000 years, John feels the weight of this and begins to sob when one of the elders comes along and says, wait, stop crying. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judas prevailed. John looks to see the lion. He sees a lamb that's been sacrificed. Come and take it. The whole thing is testamental. And to think that God came up with that idea at the last minute in the book of Revelation is a bit stretching it. It seems to have been a basic motif all the way through. It just it becomes clearer as we get toward the end of the New Testament. The writer of Hebrews and the book of Revelation particularly emphasizing this nature of the covenant where God sets the parameters just as a father laying down his last will and testament sets the parameters, and the heirs don't get to say anything. They, they have to deal with the sovereign decree, but it's the sovereign decree of a loving father. So that was the first thing you said that I wanted to mention. Second thing, we, we both used the word conspire. <laughs> well, someday we'll have to talk about conspiracy theory. Well, not right now. <laughs> that would be fun. Not right now. <laughs> but we, we have to acknowledge where the very idea of conspiracy comes from. It is a reflection of this fellowship that's in the Trinity. The Father, Son, and Spirit meet as equals. And what they have to say to one another is secret, <laughs> except insofar as they choose to reveal it. Yeah, It's none of our business. But it gets reflected into us first across the boundary of creation, but then across the border of the fall as well. In general, when we think of conspiracies in our day, we think of evil conspiracies, because that's more often than not why they happen. People want to whisper <laughs> together wicked things and plan wicked things. They don't want the world knowing. Whereas the communion we have in Christ is open. Jesus tells it, preach it from the tops of the houses and out in the street. Now, there's nothing secret or esoteric about the gospel. There is no, hey, come into this secret room and I will show you and tell you things that have been kept secret since I see and before. There's none of that. It's all open. It's all fair game. It's all for all of God's people. So should God's people ever conspire? Well, it seems to me that the conspiracy 
then, again, is across the boundary of the fall. When wicked people conspire, there may be occasions for God's people to conspire to escape them or to thwart them. And there's a great deal in First and Second Kings about God's prophets and priests conspiring to, you know, hide the prophets by fifties in a cave or to hide the king's <laughs> son until he can be crowned when he grows up and things like that. Conspiracies of light. But those aren't mm-hmm. normal. The normal thing for God's people in this world is open fellowship because God, who is the best keeper of secrets, has spoken very clearly to us and told us all we need to know. Well, the secret things are the Lord's, but the things which he reveals belong to us and to our children, that we may do all the words of the law. So there's that. And the third thing that in my circles, at least, and you are all part of that, you got to talk about storytelling just a little. <laughs> Naturally, naturally. Because the danger here, and I see this in Presbyterian theology, and first of all, as far as the letters are concerned, I buy in almost all of Presbyterian theology, except for maybe the Sabbatarian part. I, it's the Westminster Confession, one of the greatest documents the church has ever produced. But having said that, not only what you say, but how you say it does matter. Absolutely. I am, con- mm-hmm. I am concerned that when... The, the catechisms ask, who is God? The first thing we say is spirit. When that's not something that we are told until John chapter, what, two? Four? Four? Or four? Two? You know, which, where, wherever the woman in the world takes place. I always get those two passages turned around. What we're told from the first page is God's the creator. Now, that's a huge difference. And when we teach our children, is the first thing we want to tell our children that God is spirit mind, <laughs> intelligence, or if you're in the romantic tradition, she's emotion? Or do you want to say to your children, God is infinitely creative, active, and making stuff? Yeah, the temptation for someone prone by personality to rationalism, such mm-hmm. as I am, is to hear spirit and think disembodied. Yeah. Like, which is, you know, it's true, true of God in his essence, <laughs> but how God has revealed himself to me in history, in the words of scripture, is by putting on flesh. Yeah. Like that's how he extends his communion to me. And so just to start off with spirit, I agree, is not the most helpful, at <laughs> least for me personally. And then we when we come to to talking talking about covenant, you've you've shown why covenant and contract are, are, are not the same thing. There's but there's more we could say. You, you've emphasized the covenant is softly imposed and unilateral, whereas contracts are made among equals. But another thing, contracts will never cost you more than your life savings. Mm-hmm. Maybe your freedom. Maybe you, 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 you break the contract, you go into debt, you're sold into slavery. That's about as bad as it gets. Covenants are matters of life and death. They are bonds and luck. They are, Abigail uses a wonderful phrase with King David, bound in a bundle of life with the Lord. Mm-hmm. There's that communion and, and fellowship, a connection of life that, that is the covenant. And when we start treating it like a treaty merely or a contract merely, we begin to, to lose a great deal. And I think what happens is that when you think that way too long, you produce great lawyers and statesmen and you produce very few Oh, artists, novelists, painters, storytellers, storytellers. Uh, as you know, I am, among other things, uh, a director of plays. And one, I think he would call himself a Puritan pastor, excuse uh, me, not directly, of not doing good reformed plays. Are there good reformed yeah, plays? Yeah, well, that was my question. And I, <laughs> I, I went to my own pastor and said, when you think of this accusation, and his first question was, what reformed plays? I mean, I do Shakespeare. Well, he's Anglican. <laughs> okay. Agatha Christie, Anglican. Yes. Are we beginning to see a pattern here? <laughs> Why is it that some traditions seem to be better at producing art, visual or literary, than others? And maybe it's not so much the doctrines as the way we say the doctrines or the way we process the doctrines. And <laughs> so when we, we come and talk about what happened in eternity past, it's one thing to say, well, here is this discussion of this agreement, this legal agreement among the persons of the Trinity. Whether we, we don't even have to say legal, it could just be implied because covenants are legal things. And they are. 
to a point in this. It's not all they are, but they are that. That's going to give you one conception of the way God is. God is like a judge and a lawyer. He's like a court system. <laughs> Ever read Bleak House? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> the, the whole process there of the Chancery Courts and how it, they just exist to eat up your money until it's all gone because it's all... It's like a drain, right? Yeah. Like the giant drain in society is all these swirling court cases that never get resolved. They never get resolved because that's what it's all about, having more and more court cases. Now, I'm not saying that, that storytelling is the only way or the right way to talk about the Trinity, but I think it's a way you need to include because the Father, Son, and Spirit were planning something that hadn't happened yet, and that something was most certainly a story. It has a beginning. They hatched a plan, and it was they, really cool. They hatched a plan, and it was really cool. But it has all, all of the details that literary theory says a good story must. Mm-hmm. From the, the setting and the protagonist and the conflict, the rising conflict, the plot, plot complications. I do a lecture where I just talk about all the plot complications of getting Jesus into the world, let alone to the cross. <laughs> you know, and then we end then to the day to, after the uh, the climax, which is the resurrection on the day to the last couple chapters of Gospels and on into the book of Acts. That story. Uh, now, that's the story that then opens up into the, the new story of the evangelism of the world, but it's all contained in what Jesus did. He bought and paid for it all. But that whole thing that we have in the Bible, God planned. And so there there was no question that Luther, I think, or Augustine, I've heard it both ways, was asked, <laughs> <laughs> what was God doing before he created the world? The idea being that that doesn't make any sense for God just to be eternal. What was he doing all that time? <laughs> Supposedly, either Augustine or Luther, said creating a hell for the inquisitive (laughs) but the proper answer is telling stories they were planning the redemption of mankind which did not actualize until god said heaven and earth let them be there until god made heaven and earth on that first day so storytelling is a profound and important human activity because it is a divine activity but it is only so, given the doctrine of the Trinity, erase the doctrine of the Trinity, give us a purely monotheistic God, one person who either is self-sufficient in his one personness, which is to say non-personness, or who, as you said earlier, needs to create in order to complete himself. And what we know is story goes poof. It just doesn't exist. The Trinity is the necessary presupposition of literary theory as we understand it at all. And of course, you can always argue, well, that's just in the West. There are other traditions that also have <laughs> di- completely different traditions. Yeah, we've read them. They stink. They're not very good They're stories. Not good stories. They well, aspire to be stories. Yeah. And, and again, the, the, the reply would be, well, that's because you're evaluating them from a Western point of view. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we are which is to say we're evaluating them from scripture and they fail mm-hmm. but the, the, of course the truth is they fail for everybody and then anybody mm-hmm. who is well read in the literature of the world will find himself coming back to scripture and to shakespeare and to milton and to dante over the great epics and myths of the rest of the world <laughs> i i read the uh the epic of gilgamesh and the uh, anuma leash to my kids in who have lit every other year. They are nearly bored to tears by both of them. Especially <laughs> in the Can't blame them. Yeah, this is yeah. horrible. And this is the best the ancient world had. You know, it is, because they they were in rebellion against God and they all they could think about were stories that said, Hey, here's a hero. He's just like me and he's great. Look how great he is, because he's great and he just does great things, being a great guy all the time. Look how great he is. Look how he can kill things and beat up things, which is, you know, just a super hammer and that's it. And wow, wasn't this a great story? <laughs> no, it really, really wasn't. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was having a conversation uh, with some friends about First Peter or Second Peter. There, there are two times Peter brings up Noah twice. Mm-hmm. But it once in, in, in his two letters. Yeah. Right. Um, and he, he calls him, I think it's in Second Peter, because he just says the eighth person. Yeah. Um, that's what's in the Greek is Noah the eighth. Noah the eighth, yes. And, you know, there's a lot of translations out there that say Noah and seven others. 
Yeah, that's, or, see, no, that's, one that's of not, eight. Yeah, that point, like, that's not what it says. <laughs> yeah. Like, and even if it's capturing the idea of what's there, maybe, like, it's just, it doesn't leave you with an idea of eightness when right. you read and seven others. Yeah. And so this got into a whole discussion that I feel like a broken record because I say this to my friends all the time. Imagery is a thing that works in literature because it's a thing that God did in history. Mm -hmm. And so someone was trying to like sort of play these two ideas against each other where is it a numer imagist reading or is it there were eight people on the ark historically? And it's like, why not both? <laughs> like, can't God do that? Yeah, I... <laughs> I've run into that in a little book that on Revelation I mentioned, almost in passing, that the number 666 first shows up in the amount of gold that's pouring in Solomon's kingdom on the eve of his apostasy. Mm -hmm. And I just, so I just said, you know, on that basis, it's not a happy number to go on beyond that. And uh, there was one writer who did, I, I owe him courtesy because he gave me a nice review. But he spent a good part of that review taking me to task for, you obviously don't understand hermeneutics, you don't understand how things work, because this was a historical event. <laughs> exactly. That's God the appeals point. to things in history to set his images, things like the sun and the moon and kings and animals and, there, and yes, numbers and dates. Mm -hmm. You know, if you... Down the street from us, there's a, a service station. There's this big orange ball with a blue 76 on it. <laughs> now, when they were marketing their product back when I was a small child, I remember them playing up the spirit of 76. <laughs> now, was that fair or not? It's orange and blue, not quite red and blue. Later on, they tried to make it a deeper orange, almost into <laughs> red. But they couldn't quite get it there because apparently they were tied to orange for some reason. And now they're going back to orange again. But can we look at that and say, well, that, that's, that's coincidence. No, it's not coincidence. Something happened in 1776 that was a historical event that an oil company later picked up on and turned it into an entire advertising campaign. Well, was it just coincidence then that they just happened to have 76? No, actually, from what little research I've done, there were two things that went into it. And I forget, one of them had to do with something that already existed in terms of company structure or something, where the number 76 actually was a real thing already. But they, the, the founders also wanted to deliberately to pay tribute to the spirit of America, America of liberty and uh, republicanism. And so with that in mind, they deliberately chose that. Here's one image that's set forth in history by real people out to make an economic profit based upon a number that's 187 or 170 or something years old at that time. And that really happened. This this is the real <laughs> world, the real way the world works. Sometimes those who dabble in literary theory need to actually read the newspapers, I think, or Google, <laughs> which is the modern equivalent, I suppose. Going back for a moment to Noah, it, as you say, it says Noah the eighth. It doesn't say the eighth what. But if you go back to the genealogies and trace them out, uh, I, as, I actually did that as, when I was reading it as bar graphs. <laughs> you will see that Enoch died before um, died before his father. Not the normal course of things in this world, and that Methuselah outlived Lamech. Lamech. Mm -hmm. Actually, it looks like Methuselah died in the flood. Died the year, in the flood yeah. or the year of the flood. Yeah. And so by counting not the people, but those who would have borne the office each in turn, Noah is the eighth. And if you read the rest of what Peter says, it says Noah, the eighth, a preacher of righteousness, the eighth preacher of righteousness. He was the eighth ordained patriarch to declare the gospel to a fallen world. But so... So that's what happened, and, and it, ha it obviously has nothing to do with eightness. No, that's one of the places where God started this eightness thing. And Peter <laughs> yeah. and both Otherwise, of, why would Peter mention it? There's yeah, no other reason to no talk about it. There's no other reason. And in the, the, um, uh, in the other epistle, he does mention that their eight souls were saved by water. Right, why the yes. number? Why? It's, <laughs> it's totally irrelevant unless it's not. At which mm -hmm. point we realize that God, in his storytelling, He's the first storyteller. He gets to set all of the archetypes and all of the, uh, what is the word? When you set something forth, it's, everyone's going to use it after that. There's a word for that. I can't think of it. He gets to do all of that. 
And so from the beginning, when the flood, Noah's the eighth uh, patriarch, there are eight people on the ark, and we have this death and resurrection, old heavens, old earth, new heaven, new earth motif going on in the middle of this. And then a few chapters later, God tells Noah to circumcise his boy children on the eighth day. Are we listening? Did we listen back in Genesis 1 and 2, where God completed his work in seventh, seventh days? Seventh was completion. The eighth day would be the first day of the new week. Starting again. Starting all over again. It's all there. And this dichotomy that you were that you were mentioning, where well, it has to be either history, it has to be literature. Not when you're talking about God, because they're the same thing. For God. <laughs> he can pull that off. Yeah. Looks like we're about out yeah. of time. We are. So thank you so much for this conversation. It's been a great, great evening. Thank you. Emma. Thanks to David, our producer, and thanks to you, our listeners, for tuning in. Uh, you can send us an email at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. Hope to see you next week.